you really liked or really disliked this talk, talk to me later. We probably can still fix this great. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that was a year ago, but I think we... Anyway. Um, hello, everybody. So, when preparing that talk? I mean, usually when you have a talk, you have an introduction to the topic. Now I assume that all of you know what passwords are. Um, that's why you're here. However, I felt like you shouldn't do an introduction to a talk without actually saying what you're talking about. So for everybody who is bored on the first two slides, here's a kitten. For everybody else, <laughs> for everybody else, passwords are important. Passwords and pins for the purpose of that talk are kind of the same. We use them in a variety of places. Yeah. Typically, I'm asking a question, who used the password today? And usually everybody shows up, so we can just omit that here. The thing is that passwords are really seriously flawed. We all know that that's kind of the subtitle of the conference. Um, now, to get our terminology in line <clears throat> when talking about passwords and password security, we usually distinguish between online and offline guessing. What do I mean by online and offline guessing? Online guessing is when the adversary has access to a server, you can query the server, for example, credits of the kind, is that the right password for that guy? And that server typically answers, no, it's not, then you can repeat the query a couple of times. And the thing is that these online attacks are, well, sort of easily um, counterable by doing rate limiting and all the stuff, filtering by some IP, based on time, based on patterns, whatever. Um, what we are most interested in that talk are so-called offline guessing attacks. That's the case when the adversary gets all information that he needs for verifying a password guess locally on his computer, either because the password database leaked, like I, oh, wrong button, like I described here. Well, if you can't see it on that screen, anyway, um, like here. <laughs> I'm a bit afraid of that one. I will use it when really necessary. Um, apart from that, I will just use my mouse pointer here. Um, so when the password database leaks, then the adversary typically gets a password hash and you can verify against that. Or when we're taking hard disk encryption, then we're in the same situation. We have the information at hand. And that means that we can do a much larger amount of, uh, of verification guesses in the every billions. People are here that know better than I do. So that's it for kids. Um, now, Markov models are an idea that I used in password guessing for some time. We did a couple of improvements, and I think we kind of more systematically tackled the thing. Now, Markov models might not be that standard knowledge, so I'm trying to motivate and explain what they mean. Basically, the idea is that we want to guess passwords in order of decreasing likelihood. That's the entire idea. And the main question is how can we order the password in decreasing likelihood? Basically, we need to estimate the password probabilities, and the basic idea is we want to estimate that from kind of real data, take the Rocky list or something, extract passwords from that list, count their occurrences, and that uh, get the um, probability distribution. But the data is limited, and we can learn only the most frequent passwords from that list. So that doesn't really work. One nice example that I found in the Rocky list is the following. Um, we have a couple of occurrences for Bobby and a year number, but we have zero occurrences for Bobby 1998. Now the question is, is there a fundamental reason why there's no occurrence of Bobby 1998? And while we don't know for sure, um, in all likelihood there is no specific reason. So in all likelihood, all these passwords should be of about the same likelihood. However, for some statistical reason, just by chance, so to say, Bobby 1998 never appeared in the data that we have. That means if we're basing our estimate of probabilities on that Rocky list, then we will never make the guess, and that's a bad thing. Now, we need a way to generalize the observation that we do from the Rocky list. And the way we do it is using Markov models. Now, one step before uh, coming to Markov models, we can model the probability to see the password past WD. 
as the following sequence of conditional probabilities, just very intuitively, the probability that the first letter is a P, then the probability that, given that the first letter is a P, the next one is an A, and so on. That the third letter is an S, given that the first two are P, A, and so on. That's just a fancy way of writing that probability. Now, that way of writing it doesn't really help because how on earth should we estimate that probability here? It's just as difficult as estimating that probability. So that doesn't really help. But now the Markov assumption says that these probabilities can be approximated by conditional probabilities given a short history. And in the example for three grams, we take an estimate um, history of two. Sorry. Um, and we can rewrite that as an approximation as follows. The probability for password is the probability of P and A, that's just the first two written together. Then an S follows P A, that's the same as here. And then we drop the P here, and we say it's just the probability that an S follows A and S, the probability that a W follows double S, and so on. And that's an approximation. This is not really the probability that we got here, but the Markov assumption says this is about the same. And that's what we're basing on. And the fundamental idea is that these probabilities are way easier to learn from data. And in fact, we can learn up to, say, five grams pretty reliable from the Rocky list or from other possible lists. So using Markov models is just a way of making the probabilities easier to access for us from the limited data we have. And that's kind of the general formula, uh, writing for arbitrary n and so on. And the yes, how do we learn these, or how do we estimate oops, these conditional probabilities? It's basically just the count of the entire n-gram divided by the count of the prefix, so of that part here. As an example, um, the count for W following PASS is the probability, or is the, the um, dividing the count for the 5 gram PASSW by the 4 grams PASS followed by anything. Here in that example, it gives 0 0.86. That's a very basic way of doing it. You can use more clever techniques called smoothing. Um, we won't talk about that here. There's the basic plus one smoothing, where you just want to avoid that a count is zero um, by adding one. There are way more um, clever ways falling back from five grams to four and three grams when the five gram count is too low. But that's not of uh, interest here for that kind of reduction. And now coming back to the Bobby example, if we um, learn the three grams from the Rocky list, we see that, well, we first get, uh, it doesn't work right, um, we use all these three grams, BOE, OBB, BBY, and so on, and now we see that the only difference is in the last three grams, 9 and 8, 9 and 7, 9 and 6, and the counts for these three grams are pretty much the same, which means that the probabilities, the probability estimations based on Markov models for these three passwords are basically identical. That is a bit higher, that is a bit higher, that's a bit lower, but we now, we now get what we kind of expected, maybe that Bobby 1998, 1997, 1996 are as likely as each other. And that's kind of the basic idea of, of Mark models. Now, we want to use that knowledge that we have now for password guessing, for measuring strength of passwords, and finally, I will say some words on how to use personal information in password guessing based on Mark models. That's what we're going to do the rest of the talk. Good. Um, another basic slide, again a kitten. Um, how do we do password guessing? Um, we have a hash, we want to find the password. We do that iteratively, we guess a password, we verify a password, and we start over if that guess is incorrect. Now, 
For that talk, we want to concentrate on the first part, on guessing the password. Um, we are not concerned with verifying the password. All passwords that we've used in our tests are in plain. We're not concerned about the speed of actual hashing. Very interesting to talk uh, about Ketchup. There are many more ways to do that, many more people that know that better than I do. We concentrate on clever ways to guess the passwords. Thanks, Mark Models. Previous work um, from Arvind Narayanan, um, based on Markov models, that's what you might know. Uh, and as far as I know, that's implemented in Charles the River. Um, new mode, that's the Markov mode. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure they're implementing exactly their approach, or at least something very similar. Um, what they do is they enumerate all passwords that are more likely than a certain threshold. That means you pick a threshold, you pick that typically so that you have a specific number of guesses, and then you start enumerating passwords that are more likely than that threshold. Which is fair enough. Um, the drawback is, and we now concentrate on the lower three lines, this is the guessing success of that mode. And you can see that's a pretty straight line here. Um, why is that? Because we are outputting the passwords on that mode, is outputting the passwords in some order, but not ordered by their likelihood, just in, in a random order. And that's why you need passwords sometimes, and sometimes you don't. And you can't really influence that. Here we did one, uh, 10 billion guesses, trained a large fraction of the election list, and tested against fraud in MySpace and some Facebook passwords, and all lines are kind of pretty similar. And it was published at uh, CCS 05 and implemented. Um, the upper line we will talk about in a second. Now, our improvement as compared to that is that we found a way to output the guesses in the right order. And that thing we call Omen, um, ordered Markov enumerator that's joint work with Claude, Barry, and Danielle. And I want to show you how that works before describing how good it works. We do some pre-processing, which is kind of boring and the same as Arvind is doing in his work. We discretize probabilities, which means that we are taking the continuous values from 0 to 1, and we are sorting them in buckets. That's basically all we are doing. We are choosing parameters so that we have about um, 10 buckets. We call them levels, L, and the most likely probability is level one, uh, level zero, the next less likely is minus one, minus two, and so on. So we're starting at zero, that's the most likely one, and going downwards up to minus nine. That's just because we're taking logarithm here, that makes things negative, doesn't really matter. And why are we doing that? Same reason as Arvind does it, that makes probabilities additive. We don't need to multiply them anymore, but we can add them, which makes things easier for us in what follows. Now that's the algorithm. We, oh no, um, we start at an overall level of zero, which is the most likely level. And then we're going downwards to the negative values, minus one, minus two, minus, and so on, up to minus 70, whatever. Then we are building vectors A, consisting of components A1 to AK minus 1, um, so that all the values are smaller or equal to 0, non positive, and they sum up to the current level we are enumerating about here. Then we are taking all two grams that have level A1, we take all three grams that match these two grams and have level A2, and we do that until we are reaching the end of that vector here, and in the end we output all passwords that match these n grams. Now, did anybody understand what's going on? Probably not. Good. Um, that's why you're an example. And the example is for k equals 3, so 3 grams, um, k equals 3 passwords of length 3, that's short passwords, but it's easy to generalize, and here is the algorithm again for reference, and we're using that artificial data, um, say, 
2 gram AA is pretty likely in a state of 0, AB is pretty likely in a state of 0, AC is a tiny loss, not so likely anymore, and anything else is extremely unlikely. And the same goes for 3 grams, the probability that an A follows an AA is pretty high, whereas the probability that an A follows AC is kind of low. Good. I said we are starting with a level of zero. That's what we're doing here. Then we enumerate all vectors that are vectors of two elements now, so that each element is non-positive, and they sum up to the current level. Now, how many vectors are there with non-positive elements that sum up to zero? There is exactly one, namely the vector zero, zero. That's the one here. Now we take all two grams of level A1. That means we are going through that list here, looking for all two grams that have level A1 or 0. Good. This is AA and AB. These two things here. Now we take all matching three grams that have level A2. A2 is 0 again. So which are the matching three grams that have level 0? That one here is matching, AA, and followed by an A as level 0. That gives the password AAA. Wonderful. First guess. Next guess is B following AA as level 0. Second guess. Now that's it for AA. Let's turn to AB. With level 0, AB followed by an A has level 0. Third guess. And that's it for level zero. Then we're stepping downwards. Level minus one. Now we have two vectors that satisfy that requirement here. They should sum up to minus one. And each one should be non-positive. That means we have minus one, zero, and zero minus one. Now the 2 gram matching the minus 1 is exactly the AC. We write that here. We are trying to find the matching n gram that is level 0. And we will see that <coughs> there is actually none because A following AC has minus 4 and anything else has minus 9. So there's no password that we out in that case. And then we continue again. We have here two 2 grams that match level 0. And C following AA, that's a valid guess because C following AA is level of minus 1 and also Z following AB has level of minus 1. So next two guesses, then we're stepping downwards, current level minus 2. Now we have three vectors that match, namely minus 2O, minus 1, minus 1, and O minus 2. And so we are proceeding downwards until we made enough guesses. <laughs> so, in case you got the idea how the algorithm works, that's great. In case you didn't get the idea, don't worry too much. Basically, the thing is that we are approximating because we're doing levels, but apart from that, we are enumerating a decreasing order of likelihood, and that's a good thing. Because now, we get the results in the upper three lines um, because we're guessing likely passwords in the beginning. We have a well much better guessing rate in the beginning than um, Arvin's approach has. And then, of course, we're decaying because there are no more passwords left. Um, in the theory, these lines should meet here in the end um, at the same point because, based on the Markov model, Arvind is enumerating all passwords that are more likely than a third threshold, and we are doing that by that point as well. So why is there a difference between those lines here? Um, one reason is that Arvind's approach as implemented in John uses 2 grams. We use 3 grams, so we get a slightly better approximation. If we are implementing Arvind's algorithm for 3 grams, those lines should meet here at exactly the same point, and there's still the pre-processing that might be slightly different for their part and our part, but in theory, they should be at the same point here. 
the thing is that we are way better in the meantime. So yeah, obviously. Good. Then there's um, another password guesser uh, by Matt Bayer, uh, based on probabilistic context-free grammars, which is basically an idea to learn the um, uh, missing word here, um, Mangling rules, that's what I'm looking for, sorry. Um, basically an automated way for learning Mangling rules from data, and here we observe the following depending on the data set. Um, Medwise approach is slightly better in the beginning, in particular that solid gray curve here is actually exceeding ours, the corresponding curve is that dotted line here. So here is better, um, but kind of uh, at any other point, um, and eventually the Markov innovation gets better than his approach. And it's hard to tell the reason for that. Um, it's probably lying in the password structure. In some sense, you can say that Markov models learn a very local structure of a password, so they are learning three grams, four grams. They don't really care about the connection between the beginning and the end of the password. They can't because their history is too short. That's the approximation that Markov models make. And Matt Weyer, um, he can have dependencies between the beginning and the end of a password, because he's, he's learning the entire structure. And that's actually a very interesting point I'll come to later in the talk. Uh, can we combine the two ideas about learning the local structure and global structure? That would be a very interesting thing if we could improve here, and yeah, probably get a little better here in that part, here or something. Good. Um, I wanted to say that this thing is implemented, it's running, um, however it's research-grade code. Um, you might know what that means. We don't really understand the code anymore. Uh, we're currently having a student that is cleaning up the code, and as soon as he's finished, he's implementing improvements, he's yeah, trying to get it a bit better. Um, as soon as he's done, we're more than willing to make that available to everybody. So wait for next year, February, March, we will see. <coughs> Good. Now we know how to guess passwords efficiently. Um, now, at the same time, we probably want to defend against somebody guessing our passwords, and we found that market models are pretty good in that as well. At least way better than commonly used um, password rules that you can see up there. Um, I probably don't have to tell you, and I should have put a kitten on that slide as well. Um, they're basically worthless. Um, if you fill the rock queue for all passwords that contain letters and numbers, then the outcome is what you expect. Apart from ABC123 and 123ABC, any password is uh, has a pretty specific structure. Link 182 is an exception as well. Uh, it's pretty obvious that none of these passwords are really secure. It's good. Anyway. Also, the Microsoft Password Checker um, scores a password consisting of 11 randomly chosen lowercase letters as weak, even though they have enough entropy to be a DS key, which is way more secure than most other passwords. But the password with capital A, at and zero instead of an O, that one's considered strong, um, even though it's way weaker than the above one. Marcus. Yes. Blink 182 is a rock band in the US. I know. Yeah. Yes. That's why. I mean, that's why I said that is a different structure, but it's not really secure either. Um, or horribly secure, so to say. Uh, and I love you too, it's also not really strong, even though there's no one at the end. Thanks. Good. So, our idea was um, what would be an optimal password checker and. You might think that definition might be a bit academic, maybe it is, um, but I think it's useful and maybe we can get that somehow closer to practice or maybe we can just implement it as is. We'll see and I'm happy to any discussions regarding that point. We would say that the optimal password strength meter or the optimal password checker is the one that outputs a score which is inverse in the likelihood of the password. Intuitively, if the password is likely, then the score is low, if the likelihood is um, is low, then the score is high. That's what, what we would hope. 
Now the question is, how do we obtain the likelihood of a password? And we could base that on available data, but that likelihood might depend on the site. It depends on the site, actually. Um, it might vary over time, and so on. So what we are kind of proposing is to compute, or that should be a P of X, we compute the likelihood P of X from the current password database. Now I should see at least two hands and some worrying faces, um, which is entirely correct, because storing your passwords is playing in the Agra database is probably a very bad idea against everything that we teach anybody else. So, what do we do to save that idea still? Um, oh, first an example, um, the database may real passwords, of course. The database is more likely to be, re to be revealed eventually than not. And what's kind of mean is that strong passwords are particular, particularly vulnerable. Um, take that password, which is probably pretty secure, before I showed it on that slide. Um, and in the Engram database, um, this is what ends up in the Engram database. Most likely, each of those engrams appears, or each of these five grams appears only once. And you can just take those five grams, chain them together, and you get the database. So you have the paradoxical situation that if you're taking stronger passwords, they are more affected by leakage of the Engram database than weak ones, which is a very unfortunate situation. Fortunately, we have a solution. And I'm only skimming over the solution. Um, basically, it's pretty simple. We take the Engram database and we add a lot of noise. It's wonderful. That sounds a solution to every problem. The thing is, we do have a proof that that really works. Um, we have a proof that if we add enough randomness, then, wonderful, right in time, if we add enough randomness, then we can prove that not too many bits of information leak from that password database for whatever information of bits. Um, no time to talk about that here, ask me if you're interested. At the same time, we can show, we can demonstrate from our implementation that the accuracy doesn't degrade too much when adding noise. So by adding noise, we can increase the security and it only slightly affect accuracy. Um, I'll show you two slides with experimental data. That one uh, is obtained the following way. We took a random threshold for probabilities and we considered those that appear more often than with the probability 2 to the minus 20 as secure and the others as weak. That's pretty, uh, pretty random value. Um, and we classify passwords into strong and weak, and this is the, um, uh, the chart showing false positive and true positive rates. How to read that graph, if you're not familiar with it. Um, if you're assigning a random label to each password, then you're ending up here on the diagonal. You can see that NIST and uh, also the others, I don't have the other graphs here, are actually pretty close to the diagonal. The optimal uh, solution would be here. The optimal solution would have a zero false positive and a 100% true positive rate. Our estimation based on more of five grams, that's the solid line here, this is pretty good. And if you add randomness, if you make that solution secure, you degrade only until that point. So you're still pretty close to the optimal solution and only slightly decrease performance. And yeah, to demonstrate the dependency on the actual site you're using, we have it here that um, that curve is trained on the PHP BB dataset and uh, tested against RockQ. You can see that using passwords from a different site <coughs> actually substantially decreases your performance. <coughs> Second slide. Here we measured um, Spearman correlation, which is correlation of the rank, so the position where the password is ranked. Um, and the results are pretty similar. Top line here is for mark of five grams, the pure thing, and the next is um, with adding noise. 
And what's nice about that slide is because you can say that um, the estimation based on Microsoft and Google and NIST is actually hardly related or hardly correlated with the actual strength of password. Is that a nice thing to say? That's why I have that slide here. Good. Now some finally brief um, thoughts or brief results on using personal information like a username or even more information for password guessing. Um, this is kind of done in practice, mostly based on the username and derived values from the username. And what we did is we took it a bit further. As far as I know, nobody else did it um, using more personal information about the user. Only public profiles. Um, and that was pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, first, if you have mangling rules, then you have to say somehow how do you use that personal information? Um, how do you mangle that? Should you also use substrings? How do you select the substrings? That's always a different, uh, difficult question. With, with engrams, what you can do is you take that information and you take all the engrams from that information and you boost that information. Uh, you, you boost those engrams. And that way you automatically boost likelihood or you increase um, the probabilities for passwords that also contain substrings of that personal information. And what we found was that um, our information siblings, locations, even username, first name, and birthday were actually useful. The other information did not have any influence on guessing passwords at all, or not measurable. And we had a nice clever way to determine which information is actually useful. Details as if you're interested. We found that about 5% of the accounts that we had had a strong overlap between username and password. And these are some results. For now, forget about the upper lines. The interesting are these two lines. Um, the lower one is guessing without information, and the upper one is guessing with actual information. And now I don't know about your feelings. I would have expected personal information to be more useful, actually. What we found is that it doesn't really change the game. Um, it really helps uh, with a few number of guesses. Here we can see quite an increase in, uh, in guessing success. But in the long run, the um, increase is pretty low. And I found that very interesting because it appears to me that a number of people think that, well, if you get enough information about a victim, then you can get his passwords anyway. If you completely collect his friends and siblings and his hobbies and whatever, then you have an easy time getting passwords. And while this is not exactly what we see in that graph, the graph indicates that this is not the case. So in that sense, it's a, it's a very good result that we are not totally insecure. Good. To conclude, what did I tell you in that talk? I told you that Markov models are very useful with passwords. You should give them a look. Whatever you do with them, they are typically very good. They consider a local structure, so they are not the silver bullet that solves all problems. There is a way to store them securely, but there are also many ways to do them securely. And personal information and market models mix very well. Less helpful than we thought. At least on the data we tried. That's the big case here. We have limited data. That data might be biased in various directions. So take that last section with a grain of salt. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions in case something was left open. So say you have the Facebook email, Gmail, and Hotmail password, mm -hmm. then yes, you did not have uh, the training of the training. No, the information that we had was we had a list of Facebook passwords, 
from somewhere. Um, we scrap the Facebook profiles for those people and use that information to correlate. Only one password. Right. That's what I mean by saying that a limited data set, it was only 5,000 accounts, so that's pretty low number for statistical purposes. Yeah. Right. More questions? Um, you mentioned something about comparing the Markov model with uh, NIST. With, uh, I think I missed something there. What exactly are you comparing? Uh, okay. <clears throat> I compared um, the entropy estimation given by NIST, which is probably not really the right thing to do, um, with the strength estimation based on Markov models. So we are assuming that, well, you can use NIST as a kind of a password strength meter, and you can use Markov models as a password strength meter. And Markov works better than NIST, basically. Yeah? You mentioned also if you repeat this database for a site and you use the database. If you randomize it like you can you use guesses against that? Model to reconstruct the market trends. I mean, what do you mean by model? You mean I, how your yeah, I mean, random mix generated? If, if, if you get the database and you have a, a model model, could, could you still use that to help you guess passwords in a database? Because you said that if you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, when you get the Markov model for a site, then you get an approximation to the distribution of passwords used for that site. <coughs> That's correct. And the thing is that I assume or we assume that an attacker can get an approximation to that distribution anyway. Um, you probably take a huge list of passwords and then you see what is the name of the site, what are the users, what is the language, and it's probably not too hard to get a pretty, uh, pretty accurate approximation. To that distribution anyway, so that's why we say that's not a big problem. They really do that as well. Right, good point. Should have said that. Yeah. About uh, the noise in the uh, Marco Emperor and the database mm -hmm. that you uh, collected, because uh, you said that um, uh, some uh, secure passwords would be made uh, more vulnerable because uh, they are basically stored everything in the database, so you have to add noise uh, mm -hmm. to protect them. but. How do you measure exactly how much you have protected them? Because if, uh, according to your graphs, uh, you are not deviating uh, that much from uh, the original results, is it maybe just like uh, making it slightly blurry uh, in terms of picture? I, mean. um, I will visit a lot of details there. Um, maybe we can talk in more detail at the next break. Basically, what we are doing is we are Whenever a password is added, we are running over the entire, entire database and adding another engram with a very small probability. So basically, we're adding binomial noise to every engram, and what happens is that I forgot the exact probability, but typically, when you added a million passwords, every engram would have at least a count of 100 or something um, with a certain variation. The thing is that that variation is identically distributed for uh, the variation that corresponds to noise is identically distributed for every engram position. And that's why the effect of that is pretty low for the overall estimation. Uh, that's why the ordering is so. When computing the conditional probabilities, those effects more or less cancel out uh, for statistical reasons. However, if you have a single Engram from a very strong password. Um, if the randomness has already 100 counts, plus minus 50, then the one engram that you're adding for that secure password is hardly distinguishable from the from the noise, or it's de facto non distinguishable from the noise. Yes, that, that's my question. Actually, I understand how it cancels out. Find find each other in the, <laughs> in the next yeah, break. That's yeah. what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, well, if you would be saying that, uh, at least on one side, right? Yes, I yeah. Right. So there would be lots more time to talk about it. Also, the first day also. Yeah, the first day. Yeah, well, we can do that. Yeah. So, thank you about this.